My name is Jacob Faltz, but almost everyone knows me as Jake. My parents emigrated from West Germany in 1979, well before the reunification of their home country. My mother was pregnant with me when they left, and I was born here in Canada. They landed in Montreal, and my father set about looking for work as a goldsmith. He was trained in Germany, and with his background he had little trouble finding a job. I was an only child for a while, but a couple of years later, my mother gave birth to my brother, Michael. Young Mike is quite an athlete, currently playing professional soccer with the Montreal Impact. My father prospered in his trade, and not long after Mike was born, he opened his own jewelry shop in the West End. He makes a good living for himself and my mother. They own a nice house in Beaconsfield and spend some time in Florida in the winter. Father has two talented goldsmiths working for him now, so he isn't tied to his shop every minute of every day. When I talk to mom, I get the feeling she is very pleased and satisfied with their life. I'm happy for them. I was an ordinary student in school, as much interested in girls and hockey as I was in my studies. I graduated with a C plus average, with my only really good grade in the English language. Fat lot of good that did me in Quebec. I immediately went out looking for a job. My spoken French was only adequate, while my written French was much better. It was a struggle to find a decent job with the future in French speaking Quebec with the part one Quebecois running the show. They had little tolerance for Anglais, and I had problems finding meaningful employment. I finally took a job with a Vancouver-based wholesale building materials company that was just setting up in Montreal. I worked on the customer service desk for a year before an opening came up in Vancouver. It was a bigger operation and paid more, so I put in my application. I was surprised when I was accepted. I thought there would be a dogfight for the job, but I learned later it was my French skills that tipped the scales. I never did figure out why that would be important in British Columbia. I moved to Vancouver and immediately discovered I had found my future home. It was so completely different from Montreal, so much more modern and West Coast. Everything seemed new. Of course, I landed there during a nice summer, and that didn't hurt either. One trip to the beaches and I was hooked. It might have been the bikinis, or it might have been the mountains, or maybe even the freighters anchored in the bay. I didn't care. This was where I wanted to be. I haven't changed my mind and I don't suppose I ever will. I made some friends along the way. Some from work, and some from the hockey games we played at the three-rink multiplex. I'd never played junior hockey but I loved the game, and since I was single and had lots of time, I joined a beer league. Lo and behold, I was a first-line defenseman on an electrical company's team. It didn't take long to figure out it was because I could skate backwards. I didn't care. It was fun, and something to do that kept me fit and occupied. At the end of the season, we had an outdoor barbecue for the team and all the families and friends who had supported us. It was there that I met Judy Hansen. Judy and I hit it off because, like me, she was an Anglais from Montreal. In her case, she was from Dollar Dormo, just west of the airport at Dorval. We had lots to talk about, and it got us off on the way to becoming a couple. We exchanged numbers, and I called her a couple of days later and asked her for a date. She said yes, and that's how it all started. Judy is a good-looking woman. Not a knockout, mind you, but still very attractive. I sneaked a look at her driver's license one day and found she was 170 centimeters and 132 pounds. She has dark brown hair, cut short around her neck, and she needs little to take care of it. She calls it her wash and wear hair. She doesn't wear a lot of makeup, but then in my opinion, she doesn't need to. She has a nice body and a slim backside, plus great legs. When she wears slacks, she looks very elegant. She has excellent posture, and it helps accentuate her good looks. She also looks good in a bikini. Judy and I went out regularly, and within a year, I proposed and she accepted, although not immediately. We had been discussing the future before I popped the question, and it was obvious to me that she wanted some assurance that I was going to be something more than a customer service rep. I told her that I had asked for an opportunity in sales and had been promised a chance when the next vacancy came about. That seemed to satisfy her. We had been having sex for a few months now, and Judy was an enthusiastic lover, although a bit conventional. We were intimate several times a week, and she appeared to be satisfied with my performance. Judy worked at a laboratory that did medical testing for the private clinics around the province. She had trained hard to become a technician, and she was very proud of her status. She liked the work, and liked the people she worked with. They were all women except for their boss, Bob Turnbull. When we planned our future life together, we sat down and looked at what our combined incomes would be. If I got the sales job, we would have close to $90,000, not counting any bonuses I might earn. It might even allow us to buy a house in the red-hot market we were facing. So Judy accepted my proposal, conditional on my getting the sales job. Happily, it came along a few months later, and we set the date. I called my parents and my brother to tell them the good news, and they were very happy for me. 
Judy indicated her parents were a little more wary, but happy just the same. Both parents made plans to be at the wedding. We were married in a small church in the suburbs that had time available the following April. I met Judy's family for the first time and I have to say, they were pretty cold toward me. I wondered why, but Judy dismissed my concerns. My folks were in good spirits and welcomed Judy to the family. But again, her parents didn't seem to warm to my folks either. On the other hand, Judy seemed to be quite friendly with Mike. Perhaps because he was a professional athlete, or maybe they just hit it off. At least it took some of the pressure off during the reception. We went on a short honeymoon to Victoria and Seattle before coming home and settling down in our rented apartment. I was working hard to do well in my new sales job and so far, my boss was happy with my results. I had some objectives to reach this year and by mid-year, I was pretty sure I was going to achieve them. Judy was happy to continue working in the lab. Her hours were more predictable than mine. 7.30 am to 4 pm. Mine were irregular, often spending 4 or more hours on the road traveling from customer to customer, arriving home after 6 pm after battling heavy commuter traffic. Life went along quite smoothly for us. We finally saved enough money to put a down payment on a townhouse in the suburbs and celebrated our third anniversary a week after we moved in. This would be our stepping stone to a proper home someday in the future. We talked about starting a family, but Judy was adamant that she didn't want to do that until we were more financially secure. She never was able to articulate just when that would be, but since we were both young, not yet 25, there was no panic. As with any marriage, things tended to slow down a bit in the sex department. Before we were married, we were having sex four or five times a week, except when she was having her period. That dropped to three times weekly after the first three years, and then as time went by, we were down to once or twice a week. When you're working hard, as I was, you don't notice these things right away, but after a while I did, and mentioned it to Judy. Judy, we don't seem to be making love as often as we used to. Is there any reason for that? I started the conversation after supper one night when we were just sitting quietly on the back balcony of the townhouse. No. Why would there be? The way she answered sounded strange to me. I suppose defensive, but a bit aggressive too. I don't know. We used to get together at least three times a week, but not lately. Well, we're both working hard and after all, you can't expect us to be full of energy every night. Again, I got that slightly aggressive tone. I suppose. But I do miss it. Making love to you is something I really enjoy. I was trying to make it sound inviting to her. You'll just have to get used to enjoying it a little less often for now. I'm not always in the mood, you know? I wasn't getting a very sympathetic hearing. I decided in the interests of peace that I wouldn't pursue the matter any further that night. But, it would get revisited. Our lovemaking didn't decline any further and I eventually became accustomed to the reduced frequency, assuming that it was the pace that Judy found comfortable. I wanted more, but I had come to realize not all couples, regardless of how long they were together, would want the same things at the same time. When I came to think about it, I really couldn't complain. We seem to be happy and successful, on our way to a long and fruitful marriage. I suppose it's hard to imagine how a happily married man could have a best friend who was a woman, but it happened to me. What's more remarkable about it is the fact that there was no sexual connotation to our friendship. It really was a best friend's relationship. It happened when Cindy and Al Willows moved in next door. Our townhouse was an end unit, so we only had one attached neighbor. Cindy and Al proved to be an interesting, but different couple. She was a stay-at-home mom with two children in elementary school. Al was a car salesman at a local Chevrolet dealer. Cindy was a no-nonsense kind of gal with a wicked sense of humor, a quick mind, and a sharp tongue featuring some salty language. She was 30 years old and had been married to Al for 10 years. She was a bit taller than Judy, but she had a much more developed body. Her hair was reddish blonde, curly and cut short. Her eyes were deep blue, and she had beautiful white teeth when she laughed, which was often. Her complexion showed some scarring from acne, but she didn't seem self-conscious about it. She freely admitted that Al had knocked her up and then did the honorable thing and married her. They had two children, Annabeth, the 10-year-old love child, now in grade 5, and Bradley, a 7-year-old in grade 2. Al, or Alvin as Cindy occasionally called him when she was irritated with him, was the same age as Cindy, but a different personality. He was a bit less than 6 feet, with red curly hair, a ruddy complexion and big, white teeth. He dressed in flashy suits with brightly colored ties, wearing a Rolex knockoff on his wrist and a large, gold ring with a red stone on his right pinky. If someone had told him that this is what a car salesman should wear, I must have believed him. If you listened to him, you'd think he was general manager of the dealership instead of one of the rank-and-file salesmen. He was one of those guys that you either loved because he was always up, 
or who irritated the hell out of you because he never learned when to turn it off. Unfortunately, I was in the latter category. Judy didn't have too high an opinion of Cindy, but seemed neutral toward Al. On the other hand, I liked the straightforward Cindy and we became quite good friends over the next few months. I also liked her kids. Annie, as she was mostly known, was polite and cute as a button. She would be a real heartbreaker in a few years. Her mother was a fine-looking woman to start with, but Annie was going to be something special. Brad was a fun-loving kid who loved to play and was always in good spirits. Like his sister, he was very polite and that goes a long way with me. Judy, unfortunately, didn't want much to do with the kids. That worried me for our future. Was she sending me a message that she didn't want children? She couldn't help but like these two, could she? If we were going to have children, I wanted them to be just like Annie and Brad. It was this past spring that things started to go downhill for us. We had just about saved enough to buy a house after six years of marriage. Without any warning, I was called into a meeting at headquarters and the entire staff was notified that the company had been sold to our competitor and our branch would be closed. Just like that, I was unemployed. I had four months severance plus we had our savings, but it was a shock and I was really knocked back. When I told Judy what had happened, she got mad. Mad at me for wasting my years with a company that just disappeared. Mad at the company. Mad at life in general. I got the distinct impression she was disappointed in me. That I had let her down. That this was my fault. It didn't do my spirits any good to have that heaped on me. I started looking right away of course, but there were no jobs locally in my field of expertise. Judy would get up, give me a remote peck on the cheek and head off to work. I would scour the want ads, try to arrange appointments, and drink more coffee than I was used to. After two fruitless weeks, I was depressed and I guess it showed. I was sitting on my bedroom balcony one morning, coffee in hand, staring into the distance when I heard a familiar voice. Hey, handsome, got any more of that coffee? It was Cindy and I had to smile. She had decided, for whatever reason, that I should be known as handsome, and freely called me that, even when Al and Judy were present. It didn't seem to upset either of them, so I just accepted the moniker. Come on over. The back door is unlocked. I'll meet you in the kitchen. I was reaching for the cream when Cindy pranced through the back door into the kitchen and flashed me her best smile. Just seeing her do that helped lift my spirits. So what are you doing home in the middle of the morning these days? Sick leave? I wish. I got let go the Friday before last. The company has been sold and the whole staff is out of work. Shit, that stinks, she said. So, I take it you're looking? Yeah. Unfortunately, I was in a shrinking industry and it just shrunk a lot further. It's pretty much all I know, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I've got my resume in at all the other places, but it doesn't look good. I can try at the retail level, but they don't pay anything like what I was earning. Huh, she muttered. Then I watched her as her mind started working. I knew Cindy well enough now that she had already taken on the responsibility of trying to help. It was interesting to see the contrast between Judy and Cindy's attitudes. I sat quietly, sipping my coffee as Cindy pondered. Jake, remind me. When you were in school, what was your best subject? English. I seem to have a feel for it. I mean, writing. For a while I thought about being a writer. Maybe working on a newspaper or a magazine. Unfortunately, that's another industry that's getting smaller. Yeah. I thought you told me that. I have a girlfriend who's a writer. She writes manuals and instructions and things like that. She works from home. All she needs is a computer and an internet connection. She told me a while ago that she was turning down business because she was working so much. I don't know how much it pays, but she has a nice new Mazda and a fancy condo in the city. It must pay something. Humph. I'd never even know of that, I admitted. Tell you what, handsome. I'll give her a call if I can use your phone and you can talk to her. Maybe she can put you onto something. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Her name was Paula Woods and I caught her just at the right time. When Cindy handed me the phone, I offered to call back later when she wasn't so busy, but she said she was taking a break, and since I was a friend of Cindy, she'd be happy to talk to me. She had been in the same situation that I was in, out of work and needing a job. She had answered an ad in one of the local papers and met with the manager of this import, export business. He needed someone to write manuals and instructions for imported products that came from China and other Far East countries. The English versions they were sending were useless, if not downright hilarious. He wanted a practical instruction sheet in English for his customers that would give them the right information. Paula signed on and has never looked back. They keep after me about finding someone who can translate into French, too. They're paying one of these translation services, but it's very expensive. He wants someone in-house to handle it. He can find bilingual people, but not writers. He needs both together. 
He's also in the machinery business, and it's a real problem getting a decent owner's manual prepared. That's not something I can do. Paula gave me the name of the agency that was importing the machines, as well as the name of her contact. I asked if I could mention her name, and she happily agreed. I turned the phone over to Cindy for the girls to have a quick chat while I poured myself and her another coffee. Cindy, you and Paula may just have saved my life. I don't know how to thank you. No need. It was fun to watch you light up again. You looked pretty down this morning. Yeah. Well, I don't think Judy has come to grips with our situation yet. She's not very happy with me being out of work. It really puts a crimp in our plans. Jesus, Jake. You didn't get fired. What happened to you happens to all kinds of people every day. It isn't their fault. It's just the way things are right now. I don't know how many times I'll has come home with a hangdog look because he was down near the bottom of the totem pole that month, wondering if they were going to fire him. I'd give him a little pep talk and a nice warm roll in the hay, and he's up and at him the next morning, she laughed. Sounds like a winning formula. I agreed. I was envious of Al that Cindy could handle a situation that way when Judy was so negative. No pep talk. No roll in the hay. I picked up the phone again and called the number I had copied from Paula and asked for Mr. Louie. He came on the line a minute later, and I told him I had been talking to Paula Woods, and she suggested I call him. I told him I could write French as well as compose copy fairly well, and would be willing to give him a free sample to prove my point. Mr. Louis, who spoke fairly good English, jumped at the chance, asking if I could meet him this afternoon. It just so happened I had the afternoon free, and we arranged an appointment for 2 p.m. I hung up the phone and walked over to Cindy and gave her a big hug. You don't know how good this feels, Cindy. I damn near had tears in my eyes. I had a chance and I was going to grab it with both hands. Cindy just grinned and sipped her coffee. Glad to help. Cindy headed back home just after 11, and I whipped upstairs to shower, shave, and brush my teeth. I picked out a clean dress shirt, my navy blazer, and tan slacks, choosing to change after I'd made my lunch. No point in taking a chance on spilling food on my clean shirt or tie. I met with Mr. Louie promptly at 2 that afternoon, and he ushered me into his office. He was a balding, mid-fifties Asian man with bad teeth and a rumpled suit. I began to wonder if maybe he couldn't afford proper translation services and was just looking for someone who worked cheap. On the other hand, Paula had said she was happy working with him, so the least I could do was to listen. I import many machines from China and Thailand. Some are for plastics manufacturing and some for molding containers. Others are for woodworking. The instructions they send are in Chinese, and then someone has tried to translate them into English. Even I cannot tell what they're trying to explain. I have to read the Chinese to find out. My customers are usually not Chinese, so I need to have good English instructions. Now I want to sell to chain stores, and in Quebec, I must have French instructions before they will take my products. I am paying very high prices for translation services, and then I have to go back more than once because they do not understand the machinery and how it functions. I need someone who can understand the equipment and the instructions. He finished and sat quietly, his fingers gabled in front of his chest. I understand your problem. The only thing I can suggest is that we give it a try and then, if I can do the work, we can work out a fee schedule that works for both of us. Agreed? Yes. That is a good suggestion. I hope you can do this job. It would be very helpful to my business and I would make it worthwhile for you, he promised. Why don't you give me an example and we'll see how it goes. I can work here or I can take it home and bring it back tomorrow or when I am done. I think you would find my computer difficult to use, he smiled. I suggest you use your machine and let me know when you're finished. We can review the results then. Good. If you'll show me the instructions, I'll get going. He walked to a side table and took a thin, multi-page folder off the top of a pile and handed it to me. Come with me, he said. He took me out into his warehouse and I was immediately surrounded by crates of equipment as well as open machinery sitting on the floor. It was all new and painted. Some pieces I recognized and others I did not. This is the machine that your instructions are for. Please look it over. If you have any questions, please ask. I nodded as he stood by me while I compared the drawings on the manual with the actual machine. They looked identical, but appearances can be deceiving. How would you rate the accuracy of these drawings? I asked him. Most of them are quite good. Occasionally, they will send old drawings with new machines, and that causes much difficulty. Then I have to go back to the factory and wait for new drawings. I have machines on the floor that I have paid for which I cannot sell. Very bad for business. I can imagine. Well, this set of drawings looks pretty much like this machine. So I'll get started and if I run into problems, I'll call you. This first job is a free trial as I said. I want to find out if I can do this job and then find out if I can make a living at it. He nodded with a smile. A wise precaution. 
I slid into my car and started for home. I was really up and fervently hoping this was going to turn out to be something worthwhile. It had nothing to do with my previous job, but on the surface it was so much more interesting. If I could make it work, I was sure I would be happier. It didn't take long for Judy to pour cold water on it. What do you know about machinery? How can you possibly make any money out of this? Well, I've talked to someone who already is making a living at it. She works from home most of the time, which is what I would like to be able to do. Oh great, you sit around all day, drinking coffee while I work my butt off in the lab. Why do you think that? If I take the job, it's true I would be doing it here. It would also cut our expenses. No commuting. Seems to me, it would be a better situation for us. You're going to have to show me that you can earn a living, Jake. I have my doubts. It can't be that easy or everyone would be doing it. Well, keep in mind that I have a mechanical mind as well as some skills in writing. On top of that, I am bilingual, which isn't common in this part of the country. I think I've got a good chance, but I won't know until I try. How much is this guy paying you for this job? Nothing. It's a freebie to show him I can do the job, and then I can figure out what my time is worth. If I set a price now it may be too low, and then I'll have a hell of a time getting it up to where it should be. Great. You work for nothing just to get a job you don't know if you can do, or how much it pays. Just great, she said, stomping out of the room toward the kitchen. That really good feeling had just evaporated. Maybe it would come back when I proved that I could do the work, and it paid well. Maybe. I couldn't wait to get started and right after we finished the dinner dishes, I was off to our home office and onto the computer. I pulled out the English version of the instructions and began to read. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It was mangled so badly that any idea you could instruct someone on the maintenance and operation of this machine was a fantasy. I took a deep breath and began. I quit at midnight when the oncoming headache reached its peak. My neck was stiff from attempting to understand what they were trying to say and then getting it down on the word processor. I had managed about a page and a half of the six-page instructions. It was slow going, but gradually I was beginning to see a pattern developing. It took one hour just to do the first paragraph, while the last one I tackled took a little less than 30 minutes. Judy had long since gone to bed when I finally turned out the light and headed off to our bedroom. I was sure I would sleep well, I could feel the fatigue from my concentrated effort, and after taking a couple of Tylenol, I slipped into our bed and almost instantly fell asleep. When I awoke, Judy was already up and dressed, having her usual yogurt and granola breakfast. She didn't drink coffee, so it was no surprise there was none made. I, on the other hand, was now a confirmed coffeeholic. At least until about 11 a.m., when I usually quit. I said good morning, and she mumbled something that might have been similar. Two minutes later she was up, and after giving me her usual perfunctory peck on the cheek, she was on her way to work. I looked at the clock. 7.10 a.m. I went back to our office and began reviewing last night's work. I saw a couple of small errors that I had missed early on, but other than that, it looked pretty good. I picked up where I left off, and within a few minutes I was rolling again. I was on my second or third cup of coffee when I heard a familiar voice. Yoo-hoo! It's me again, handsome! Cindy called from the back door. I could almost hear the smile in her voice. Come on in, Cindy. Grab a coffee. I'm in my office. I heard her open the cupboard and then the fridge and a moment or so later, she wandered into the office. My, my, aren't you the picture of elegance, she said sarcastically. I was sitting in my normal nightwear, t-shirt and boxers. Happily, my fly wasn't open. Just because I haven't shaved, brushed my teeth, showered or dressed, is no reason to think I'm a slob, I shot back. Cindy just laughed. It's a good thing you're handsome. Whatcha working on? Well, I'm am currently on page 3 of 6, translating the instructions for the operation and maintenance of the Heavenly Blossom Model 356K-14 thickness planer, I stated emphatically. Cindy burst out laughing again. Where do they get those goofy names from? I shrugged. Don't know, don't care. However, this test drive is tougher than I thought. I spent five hours last night just getting the first page and a half done. I think I've figured out the lingo now, so it's going much quicker. I should have this finished by noon, and I can start on the French. And you're doing this for free? Yeah. You sound like Judy, I said, giving her a stern look. Sorry. I take it she wasn't impressed. You could say that. However, what will matter to her are the results. In a day or so, I'll know if this is something I can do, and whether it's worth doing. Good luck. I have faith in you, Jake. I think you're going to surprise the shit out of Judy. That was Cindy for you. Always positive. Always upbeat. Always straight to the point. We sat sipping our coffees for a couple of minutes before Cindy broke the silence. Jake, can I ask you a personal question? Sure, shoot. Do you think you and Judy are happy? 
I mean, really happy? I sat for a moment, staring at my coffee cup, not answering the question. Never mind. It's none of my business. I'm sorry I asked, she said quietly. It is a damn good question, Cindy. A damn good one. I left it at that. As I expected, I finished the English version about 11.30 and called Mr. Louis. I told him I'd have the French done this afternoon, and I could drop it off to him at his office. He was surprised and pleased. He told me to come anytime I was ready, and he would see me. That gave me a good feeling about this being important to him. It had been a while since I had written any French, but with the help of my handy dictionary, and having lunch on the fly, I was able to get the French version completed by 2.30 p.m. I went over the English version again, then the French once more. I didn't see any errors, but Mr. Louis would be the judge of that. I dressed in my business clothes once more and headed off to his office to hand in my work. I sat in Mr. Louis's office as he looked over my English version, comparing it to the Chinese version he had beside it. I couldn't tell for sure, but I thought he was spot-checking various random paragraphs. I could see him nodding and occasionally circling a word here or there, but basically, making few changes. He looked up from my work. Excellent, Mr. Jake. I will send your French and English versions to our translation service for verification. Assuming they approve your French, we have an agreement for your services. He had called me Mr. Jake from the first meeting since trying to pronounce faults was nearly impossible for him. How many hours did you spend on this? He asked. Ah, uh, five last night and six today. Eleven total, I said. Very well. I will have a check for $660 made out to you. You may pick it up tomorrow, he smiled. I thought we agreed that this was a free trial, a test to see if I could do the work. I am almost certain you can do the work, Mr. Jake. I would not take advantage of you. I will pay for good work. I think we can do very good business together. That's very generous. Thank you very much, I said sincerely. To what company should I make this check? He asked. Um, why me, I guess. Jacob faults. He looked at me seriously for a moment. May I suggest you incorporate yourself? Set up your business. It will save you much trouble in the future. Also, it will deflect liability if there is a problem. I suggest you see a lawyer and get this done. Keep this money separate. You do not want a tax problem. Especially if you become successful, he smiled. I do not deduct taxes. You have to look after that. You are a contractor in the eyes of Revenue Canada. Thank you for the advice. I'll do just that. I rose and shook his hand. Please let me know if there is any problem with the French version, I said as I was about to leave. Do you not want your next assignment? He asked, looking surprised. Um, well, yes, of course, if you're satisfied I can do the job, I stammered. He smiled. I am satisfied. I will be very surprised if your French version is not as good as your English. I must thank Miss Paula for telling you about me. He passed me another manual and we walked out back once more. After reviewing the machine and comparing the drawings, I was satisfied it was a current drawing. We shook hands and I left for home with a definite spring in my step. $60 an hour. If I worked a standard 40-hour week, I would gross over $120,000 annually. Was there that much work available? The stack on Mr. Louis's sideboard looked pretty tall. I couldn't wait to tell Judy. Maybe this would change her opinion of my efforts. It seemed to mollify Judy that I was being paid and that the rate was substantial. I told her about the stack of work on his desk waiting for my efforts. It seemed to cheer her up quite a bit as a matter of fact. She even decided tonight would be a good night to make love. I really was feeling a lot better about my future in us. It's funny how quickly things can change from good to bad and back to good again. I also found myself wanting to tell Cindy as well. After all, she was the one who had sparked the idea. I began work on the next manual the following morning. I was just as anxious to get started as I had been with the first one. This job turned out to be much easier. First, because the machine was more straightforward and mechanically simpler. And second, because I had the experience to figure out what they were trying to say. I finished the English by one that afternoon and the French before supper time. A total of eight hours. I would call Mr. Louis first thing in the morning and arrange to deliver my work. That evening, I called my investment advisor, Carlo Ponetti, another ex-Montrealer. Carlo, I need your advice. I want to set up my own business and I need the name of a lawyer who can help me do that. Hey, you're going into business for yourself? His voice sounded like it was a happy surprise. Yeah, translation services. I explained the job to him and he was enthusiastic. Every time I look at something it's made in China or somewhere in the Far East. You'll never run out of business, he proclaimed. I hope you're right. Now, about that contact. Yeah, talk to Don Simmons. He's right here in this building. He specializes in business law and can get you set up properly with all the forms. 
You'll need to get in touch with Betty and sort out the tax situation. She already does your and Judy's taxes, so she'll know what to do about the new business. Thanks, Carlo. I appreciate your help. Maybe I'll have something to put in our retirement savings this year after all. Good luck, Jake. I have a feeling you're going to do very well in this venture. Us Montreal guys know how to make things happen, eh? You know it, Carlo. Say hi to Monique for me. Talk to you later. I called Mr. Louis the next morning, and he was happy to hear from me. He told me that the French translation was right on, and no changes were necessary. He was anxious to see my next project. I drove to his office later that morning, and delivered the next manual. Mr. Louis, can we set up something so that I don't have to drive in every day? I can email my translations to you, but maybe if I took a week's worth at a time, I could just grind away on them and send you the finished copy when it's done? That will be acceptable. Also, if you allow me, I will deposit your payments directly into your account. That way, I don't have to write a check and you get your money right away. That's great, but I have to set up an account for my business first. I'll let you know when that's done. Then we have an agreement. I am very happy to do business with you, Mr. Jake. Do you want me to have a contract written for your services? I thought about that. Why don't I talk to my business advisor and see what he thinks? I'll let you know. Very well. We shook hands and I left after reviewing five new manuals and five machines. It took a little over an hour, but it was a good investment of my time. One of the drawings had an omission, and while it was for the correct machine, I needed to note the omission in my translation. Otherwise, it looked like five fairly straightforward jobs. By the end of the next week, I had a new career and my own business established. I was calling it Precise Word Services, not terribly catchy, but explanatory. I had filed with the federal government for a GSD, goods and services tax, license number, and I had set up a separate bank account. I even had some business cards printed, and I designed a letterhead I could print on my own. On the advice of my new lawyer, I wrote a letter of understanding to Mr. Louis, outlining our agreement for translations from precise word services and the agreed hourly fee. I splurged and bought a color laser printer, keeping the receipt as a business expense. My tax advisor, Betty Jorgensen, gave me some advice on what was and was not legitimate business expense. I would pay close attention to that. By Thursday morning of that week, I had already finished the five manuals and returned them and the translations to Mr. Louis. I picked up six more, reviewing the machines before leaving the premises. I was beginning to wonder just how many different machines he had and when we were going to run out of manuals. I had booked 46 hours to Thursday and that made my income for the week almost $4,000 when I added Friday in. With the six new items, I would likely more than double that amount. I was working like crazy in my home office. I don't think Judy saw much of me from the time she got up in the morning until she went to bed. I would come out for dinner and help with the dishes and we would talk about whatever there was to talk about, but I was pretty much invisible for the first few weeks. Judy was curious. She had shifted from disdain for my efforts to curiosity as she saw how hard I was working. Naturally, she had some questions. How often do you get paid? She asked. I get paid for each job I hand in. I'm a contractor. I get a set amount without any taxes or other expenses deducted. It's up to me to look after all the other stuff. I could use some help right now. Money's a bit tight since you lost your job, she said, testing the waters. Okay, how much do you need? Can you spare a thousand? Um, yeah, I think so, I said carefully. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't anxious to share with Judy just how lucrative this new business was. I was pulling down almost 3,000 a week, but that meant working 50-hour weeks. My new bank account was showing a balance of nearly $15,000. If Judy knew about that, she would quickly change her opinion of my efforts. But, for some reason I can't explain, I had decided to be coy about it. I electronically moved $1,000 from my business account into our joint checking account and told Judy it had been looked after. She seemed a bit surprised, but at least pleased. I was too. I was back to contributing to the household and feeling good about myself again. I had only been out of work for two weeks, so I could hardly claim to have suffered before finding this new career. I decided to have a meeting with Mr. Louis to see just where this new business was going to go. I had a concern that it would suddenly dry up and I would be back to square one again. The upshot of the meeting was that he had much more complex machinery here and coming, and that meant much more complex translations. I was going to have many more hours of work ahead of me. I could relax. He was certain it would be a long time before we ran out of manuals. The weather had turned warm again and I was sitting on my balcony, enjoying my usual coffee when the dulcet tones of Cindy Willows caught my attention. Hey handsome, where have you been? Come on over girl, I'll tell you all about it, I said with what could only be described as a very self-satisfied tone. I was feeling pretty mellow right about now. 
My life was back on track. Cindy came in through the back door as usual, poured herself a coffee, and came upstairs to our bedroom and out onto the balcony. I haven't seen much of you lately, she said with a look of curiosity. No, I've been working hard on my new job. I want you to know that you are now talking to the president and only employee of Precise Word Services Incorporated, Jacob R. Faults. Cindy laughed, just as I thought she would with my pompous little announcement. Bullshit. Jake the president? I don't think so. I tell you the truth, madam. I am it. I am the one. I am the boss. I am king. I guess that was a little over the top, but we were having fun with just how good I felt and Cindy picked up on that right away. Goddamn, Jake. It's good to see you happy. It's been a while, you know? She was serious. Yeah, I guess it has. I feel like a big weight has been lifted off my shoulders and I can get going again. It's a good feeling. How does Judy feel about it? I turned and looked at her straight in the eye. She doesn't really know yet. You mean she can't decide? No. I mean, I haven't really told her just how good this business is. Oh. Silence. Cindy, do you remember asking me a certain question a while ago? Uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, yeah. You asked me if Judy and I were really happy, and I said I thought it was a good question, or something like that. Yeah. I'm not so sure anymore. What's more, I'm not acting like I trust her. I haven't told her about how much money I'm making. I haven't lied to her but I haven't volunteered to tell her either. Why? Damned if I know. Do you ever get that feeling in the back of your neck when something isn't quite right? Yeah, sure. I've got that feeling. I've had it for a few weeks now. I can't put my finger on it, but something's different. Cindy didn't respond. She sat there, sipping her coffee, thinking I suppose. Can I ask you a personal question, Cindy? Sure. If you were in my place, you know, making a lot of money, would you tell Al? Hell Jake. What kind of a question is that? Yeah, sorry. Maybe I should have turned it around. If I made a bunch of money, would he tell you? That isn't any better. Besides, don't you think that doesn't go through my mind every month? We live on AL's commissions. We live month to month. Some months are good and some aren't. We get by, but shit, it's tough sometimes. I'd hate to think I would hold out on me. I think that's what's bugging me. I'm holding out on Judy and I'm not sure why. That's easy. You don't trust her. She said it flatly without any hesitation. You think? I know. I can tell. There's something wrong between you two, and I'm pretty damn sure it isn't you. Why do you say that? I know you, Jake. You are right up front. Straight. No bullshit. I can tell down deep. You're hurting. I've seen how Judy treats you when she thinks no one is paying attention. Maybe you don't want to see it, but I do. She acts like she married someone beneath her. I don't know why or what would make her think that, but that's what I feel. Her parents, I said quietly. What? Her parents. They don't think much of me. Maybe it's rubbing off on her. Shit. Are they screwing royalty or something? Nope. As far as I know, her dad's a city employee and her mother works part-time at some market. Hardly royalty. Jesus, they ought to get down and kiss the ground you walk on. Nobody would treat her better than you do. I guess they had higher expectations for their daughter. Cindy flopped her head back on the chair and sighed. So what do you do now? She asked. Damned if I know. I still love her. But lately, I'm not so sure she loves me. We just aren't close like we used to be. It's like I disappointed her, and she's given up on me. I hope I'm wrong. I do too, handsome. I do too. I really didn't have any reason to be suspicious of Judy. There weren't any signs she might be having an affair. At least, none that I could detect. But a few weeks later, I got a reminder to pay attention to what was going on. Judy announced that there was a reorganization at the lab, and that she would be working a bit of overtime now, and then until they got straightened out. To be honest, I'm not sure if I was unhappy or not. We seemed to be drifting apart, little by little, day by day. It made me sad. I was about to turn 28, and we had not yet agreed to start a family, and I wondered if we ever would. I had been working steadily on my translations, but I had curtailed my night work to give myself more time with Judy. Even if it was just to watch television together, I felt it was necessary for me to try and reconnect with her. On top of that, I was contributing between $800 and $1,000 each week to our joint account. I explained that the business was now established and that I could afford to start contributing more to the household. I was billing an average of 9 hours each day, 5 days a week. That produced a gross of $2,700 each week. My account was growing by leaps and bounds, even with my contribution to the joint account. Judy was more than pleased. We were back to where we were before I was terminated. 
I was hoping our personal relationship would also revert to when we were closer, but in spite of our improved financial situation, our love life remained cool. We would make love once or sometimes twice a week, but that was all and no amount of coaxing was going to change it. Mr. Louie was happy and let me know that on a regular basis. We had yet to receive a single complaint that the instructions were incorrect or indecipherable in either English or French. That was the only quality standard I believed in. As I got better at understanding the fractured English that the manufacturers were using, it was taking me less and less time to do some of the simpler translations. I found I had some time I could save for myself. If I wanted to goof off and have lunch at a deli or a beer at the local, I could. I would make the time up in the evening or on the weekend if I had to. I didn't see much of Cindy after our intense conversation a few weeks earlier. The weather was cool and rainy, typical of the fall. The days were shorter and I found it easier to concentrate on work. There were fewer distractions. I started inviting Cindy to morning coffee and after a while it became a daily event. It was our personal time when we could talk and not worry about anyone else hearing us. We were such good friends that nothing was out of bounds. How's Judy? Cindy asked. The same. Cool to the touch, as they say. Sorry, do you think you guys will make it? I'm almost tempted to say no, but I want to keep trying. Both of you have to try if it's going to work, she said. Yeah, I know. Jake. Yeah, she's cheating on you. I froze in place. I couldn't move. Cindy would never, ever say something like that as a joke. You know this? Yeah, I know. I know who. Oh shit. What else was I going to say? I lowered my head into my hands and just remained silent. It's not your fault, Jake. What difference does it make? None, I guess. But you didn't make this happen. She did. Who is it? Her boss, Turnbull I think his name is. Yeah, that's him. Do you know how long? Not very with him. But, he's not the first. What? I found out I'll nailed her a few months ago. Holy shit. Who else has she screwed? Don't know. But one's enough, isn't it? Yeah, more than enough. I'm going to kick all out, Jake. I've had it with him. This isn't a first, and if I let him get away with it, it wouldn't be the last. I'm looking for a job before I dump him. He'll never be reliable with alimony or child support, and I have no intention of seeing my kids live in poverty. Jesus, Cindy, can this get any worse? I think I remember you asking me something like that when you were let go and Judy gave you shit about it. What a screwed up mess. I groaned. Royally, she agreed. Well, I guess that makes my financial planning a little different now. I'll be goddamned if I'm going to give her anything after this. Let her go screw with Bobby Boy. He can support her. Can't blame you. Just don't do anything they'll throw you in jail for, handsome. I count on you for my morning coffee, she grinned. Well, let's see now. You kick Al out and I kick Judy out and we both move in together and live happily ever after, I said. Only slightly sarcastically. You're forgetting something, Jake. The kids. The hell I'm forgetting them. If they don't come, the deal's off. Cindy laughed, but I could see tears in the corners of her eyes. This wasn't really funny, but we needed some relief. I laughed along with her. Damn, it was good to have someone I could talk to. We parked the problem of our spouses until tomorrow. I had work to complete, and I needed to find a way to get through living with Judy until I decided what to do. I found myself curiously detached from any emotional upheaval. I should have been furious with her, but at most, I was angry and disappointed. Not even surprised, I found. I wondered how many others there had been besides Al and her a-hole boss. I found it relatively easy to act normal around Judy that evening. I didn't change anything in my behavior or habits. I acted just as I would on any other night, and I didn't find it difficult. When we went to bed, it took me quite a while to fall asleep. That wasn't normal. I was thinking what I should do about Judy. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted proof. It wasn't that I didn't trust Cindy's word, but I wanted to see it with my own eyes if I could. Judy made it easy for me. She announced the next morning that she had to work overtime again and wouldn't be home until late. That usually meant 10 o'clock or so by past experience. I made the assumption that there was no overtime and that she was using it as an excuse to be with Bobby Boy. I phoned Cindy and told her what I had in mind. I wouldn't be home until shortly after 9, so I arranged to borrow her car to follow my wife and her pal. I parked in the public lot with a view of the clinic's parking lot. I got there about 5 o'clock, assuming they would still be there. Judy's car was there, so I figured I'd guessed right. About 10 minutes later, she came out of the lower entrance arm in arm with a tall guy. He was dressed in a nice suit, and they headed for the other end of the parking area from Judy's car. They got into a late model Mercedes, so I started the car, preparing to follow them. 
I had taken a couple of pictures of them with my digital camera. I'm no private detective and a couple of times I thought I had lost them, but luck was with me and I saw them turn into a hotel parking lot. I hung back until they were in the lobby and then pulled up to the front entrance. I watched Loverboy register, put away his credit card, and then head for the elevators. Each of them had a small overnight bag. They weren't going to bother with dinner. It was straight up to the room for sex. I pulled away and headed for home. I'd seen all I needed to see. I had taken a number of pictures of them at the front desk and entering the elevator. I returned Cindy's car and told her what I'd witnessed. She gave me a hug and told me to cool down and we talked tomorrow about what each of us was going to do. I agreed. I was in no mood to confront Judy tonight, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. I usually didn't go to work until 9 in the morning. Depending on what shift he had, he would be home anytime from 5 in the afternoon to 9 at night. That gave Cindy and I most of the day to talk about our plans before the kids got home. I was still in a state of confusion mixed with anger at Judy's betrayal. I wasn't seeing red, but I was definitely not going to let this go. The marriage would be terminated, of that there was no doubt. Tell me about how you found out, I asked Cindy the next morning. The Jungle Telegraph. One of the women that works with Judy figured out that she and Turnbull were fooling around, and said something to one of her friends, who said something to one of my friends, who knew Judy was our next door neighbor. You know what it's like with gossip. It's no fun if you can't spread it around. I don't know if Judy realizes how many people are aware of her little adventure. Well, as far as she's concerned, the one that counts knows. I was still curious. How did you find out about Alan Judy? Same way. Except it was one of our nosy neighbors. Mrs. Bryson was noticing how often I was over here visiting you. I was about to get pissed off at her when she said something about how close we were as neighbors, meaning the willows and the faults. I guess I'll have been dropping by your place when you were out on business. Now you have to admit, that takes balls with me being right here. Anyway, the upshot was that Al was here when he said he was working. Why the hell Judy would want to get involved with him, I do not know. Maybe she believed his line of bullshit about what a big deal he was at work. That's the only thing I can think of. I just shook my head, not understanding it any better than Cindy did. Do you know if Turnbull is married? She asked. I think he is, in fact. I'm sure he is. I don't know much else about him. Cindy looked at me for a moment and picked up my phone book. She looked up the Turnbull number and gave me a snarky smile as she punched in the numbers. Hello, is this Mrs. Richard Turnbull? Silence. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have the wrong number. You don't have a daughter named Felicity, do you? Silence. I see. Well, I'm very sorry to have bothered you. Goodbye. Cindy hung up the phone. He's married and they have no children. I shook my head. This woman was clever. No wonder I couldn't get away with trying to fool her. We sat quietly for a few moments. I think we should make a visit to City Hall, Jake. I'd like to see the title on the clinic property. What are you thinking? I asked. I'm just wondering what leverage you might have. You'd be surprised what a title search can turn up. Let's go. I mean if you've got the time. All the time in the world handsome, she grinned. It took 10 minutes and $10 to find out that the title to the clinic property was in the name of Mrs. Diane Turnbull. The address corresponded to the home of Robert Turnbull. Well, well, well. Guess who has who by the short and curlies? Cindy murmured. Um, let me try. Loverboy's wife owns the building and maybe he's only the manager. Very good, Jake. You go to the head of the class. I'll bet Judy doesn't know that. Yeah, if he's playing her, she's in for a nasty shock when I dump her. Ain't that a shame, Cindy chortled. We left City Hall, and Cindy took me up on my offer to buy lunch. Every minute I spent with her was one that made me feel better. Better about myself, and better about my circumstances. The restaurant was no place to discuss our private affairs, so we waited until we were back at the townhouse. So, now, what to do next? I wondered, did you take pictures like I suggested? Cindy asked. Yeah, why don't we have a look at them? I volunteered as I reached for my camera and plugged it into my computer. The pictures were downloaded and quickly appeared on my screen. I went through them one by one. Well, it's not like you caught them in the act, but these ones at the hotel desk and at the elevator don't leave a lot of doubt about what they're up to. You could hire a private detective to get more incriminating evidence, but I don't know if it's worth the expense. Whether you divorce her for infidelity or just irreconcilable differences, it won't make much difference. You might as well save your money and get ready for the worst. I never thought it would come to this, I said, shaking my head in denial. No one ever does. I couldn't believe Al would cheat on me either. But he did. More than once. I'm just upset I can't dump him now. I need to find a job first. I've got to look after the kids. Cindy. 
I hope you don't think I'm interfering in your personal affairs, but I've been turning an idea over and over in my head. I want you to listen to it with an open mind. Try to look at it without prejudice. Do you think you can do that for me? I pleaded. She looked at me, concentrating on what I just asked of her. I guess so. I'll try. That's all I can promise. That's all I can ask. I nodded in relief. The other day when I first discovered the truth about Judy, I made some wisecrack about us moving in together, kids and all. It was just a throwaway at the time. But the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. Don't jump on me just yet, I said quickly as I saw her rise to say something. My income will be in excess of $125,000, annualized. I have more work that I can handle, and I already know there's more out there if I wanted or needed it. I like what I'm doing and it looks like I'm good at it, so I can sustain this lifestyle without burning myself out. I don't have to commute, and so there's no stress, no deadlines that can't be met. I'm proposing that I buy a four-bedroom house I've had my eye on for a couple of weeks. It's still in the same school district as we are in now. You and the kids could move in as tenants until you find some work that you like. No strings attached. Jake, that's a lovely thought, but I couldn't do that to you. What about your personal life? What about your future? Surely you don't want to stay single for the rest of time, do you? No, of course not. I'm not saying this arrangement has to be permanent. If you find a good job and want to move out, then you'd be free to do so. At least you'd know you were in a safe environment with the kids and they wouldn't have to change schools. Jake, you know I think the world of you. But this isn't fair to you. If I did that and then moved out, what the hell would you do with a four-bedroom house? I shrugged. Maybe you'll decide not to move out, I said, almost cringing when it came out. Cindy looked at me, her eyes getting wider. Are you trying to tell me you have feelings for me? She asked carefully. I nodded. Sorry, but I'm afraid so. Oh shit. Now I'm really, oh, shit. Jake, don't do this to me. Do what? I asked with a slight smile. Don't mess with my head, Jake. This is too much. I haven't even kicked L out and you're coming on to me. Jesus, that's not fair. Yeah, I know. But then again, what they did to us isn't fair either. This isn't about fair. This is about what we both know. If the way I feel for you isn't how you feel for me, just say so. Another dare. Cindy sat quietly, and I could see the tears forming in her eyes. Had I pushed it too far? Too fast? She stood and began wandering around the kitchen, and then out into the living room. She was shaking her head and mumbling to herself as she did so. That was a good sign in my mind. She hadn't said no, and she hadn't slapped me one. So she wasn't sure of her decision, and she wasn't offended. Damn you, Jake, she finally said, walking toward me. How could you? Those were the last words I heard as she wrapped her arms around my head and pulled me into her ample chest. If I was going to be smothered, this was the way to go. I just hung on to her and she squeezed. When she finally let go, I rose up from my kitchen chair and put my arms around her. Can I take that as a yes? A-hole. Of course you can. How the hell could I say no to you? She cried, wiping tears from her eyes, but smiling just the same. No strings, Cindy. If it works, great. If not, no strings. She stood there, looking into my eyes, shaking her head back and forth. I'm going to make sure it works, she said, then burst out crying. Me too, I said. I had a feeling that we were going to get over the next ugly parts of our lives, and then it was going to be different. Very different. Don Simmons recommended a family services law firm, and I took his advice and gave them a retainer. I had made a decision that I would not try to hide my new income during the divorce. Although it would hurt to have to give any of it to Judy, I really didn't need the legal problems and extra expense if and when she found out the truth about my new business. I would disclose everything, but I would make any trade I could to prevent her from getting alimony. I was not about to reward her for her treachery. My lawyer was an older woman in her 60s, Marta Kinsey. Despite her age, she was sharp and more importantly, she was out to protect my interests. I revealed everything to her, and she made an interesting suggestion. She was proposing that we play a game of bluff with Judy. Assuming Judy still didn't know much about my new job, she might be encouraged to abandon the marriage with a promise of division of current assets and no alimony. We didn't have to spit out what those assets were unless we were deposed. I could also suggest I wouldn't sue the lab and her boss for marital interference. It would be worth a try. I told Marta I would let her know when I intended to serve my wife, but she could draw up and record the appropriate documents immediately. The next week went by uneventfully. Judy had two more overtime sessions, but I didn't bother to follow her. Marta called and indicated all the documents were prepared and I could serve Judy whenever I wanted. I thanked her and immediately called Cindy. 
D-Day, Cindy. I've got the papers, and now I just have to work out how I'm going to do it. Wanna come over? Sure. I'll be right there. Get the coffee ready. We sat at the kitchen table and drank our coffee, chatting about inconsequential things. I couldn't stall any longer. The way I see it going down, I'm going to confront her tonight. I'm going to tell her I know about Robert Turnbull and if necessary, I'll. Then I'll hand her the divorce papers. If she decides to kick up a fuss, I'll show her the pictures and tell her I have witnesses that will testify. I'm gambling Mrs. Turnbull doesn't know anything about their little affair, so my threat to Sue might turn the tide. Marta said it was important to make it look to Judy like she didn't have an easy way out. The rest is going to be up to her. I have no idea how she's going to react, but I'm going to have to be careful I don't let on I'm bluffing her. If she gets aggressive, then all bets are off and I'll move out, and she can get a lawyer and we can duke it out. I hope that doesn't happen, but you never know with Judy. Have you packed a bag? Cindy asked. No, but I will before she's due home. Apparently there's no overtime tonight. I smirked. Cindy leaned over and kissed me lightly and gave me a hug. Good luck. Tell me all about it. When this is done, we need to figure out how to deal with Al. That's going to be a lot uglier. I nodded. She was right. Al was undoubtedly going to be a problem. His ego would be wounded, and I was pretty sure he wouldn't go quietly. Cindy and I had already decided that she wouldn't move out of their townhouse until the dust had settled. If Al refused to leave, she would sleep in Annie's room until she was ready to go. For the sake of continuity and confirming my confidence in Marta Kinsey, I loaned Cindy enough for Marta's retainer, and we set about double-teaming our wayward spouses. That night we went through our usual routine at supper, and when we finished I told Judy and wanted to talk to her. I could see her stiffen, probably assuming it was another, we're not close enough talk. Judy, I am aware of your affair with Robert Turnbull. Since you have such little regard for me or our marriage, I have decided to divorce you. Here is the paperwork, I said in a calm, level voice. I was surprised at how unemotional I was considering this woman had consumed the last seven years of my life. The look on her face was something to behold. To say I caught her by surprise would be an understatement. I thought for a moment she was going to choke to death as she gasped for air, coughing and spluttering. At length, she got herself under control. How, how, was all she could manage. You weren't very discreet. Quite a number of people beside your co-workers were aware of your affair with your boss. Oh God, I'm sorry, Jake. I wish I could say something. I'm sorry. I shrugged. I'm proposing we split everything 50-50. We can put the townhouse up for sale and split what equity we have in it. You can buy me out if you want. I won't be living here. Again, I was calm and clear-headed. She nodded. That's fair, she said, not being able to look at me. I couldn't resist. Why? She didn't say anything immediately. I wondered if she was trying to formulate an excuse, but that wasn't the case. I thought Robert would give me a better life. He's very successful and I thought he would give me a better life. I toyed with the idea of bursting her balloon, but decided not to. Do not overplay your hand, were the last words Marta had said to me. Well, for what it's worth, I hope you can be happy. You obviously weren't happy with me. It wasn't you, Jake. You were kind and hardworking and always there for me. I guess I just wanted something more out of my life than you could give me. An upgrade, I said absently. What? No. No, not that well, maybe. Robert is very well off. He will give me a good life after his divorce. He's married? I feigned surprise. She nodded. I'm not proud of that. Me cheating on you and him cheating on her. But we were so good together and... Her voice trailed off. I'm moving out, Judy. I'll be in a local motel for a while until I find a place to live. If you agree to the settlement I suggested, you'll find the papers in here and all you have to do is sign them. You may want to consult a lawyer, just for your protection, I said, almost holding my breath. I wanted that offer at least on record. No, no. I won't fight it. I've hurt you and I'm to blame. 50-50 is more than fair. I'll sign them tonight. You can take them with you when you go. She still hadn't been able to look me in the eye. I stopped in the living room when I came from the bedroom with my back. She registered some surprise when she saw I was already packed, but said nothing. She handed me the signed papers, and I looked to make sure they were properly done, then folded them and put them in my pocket. If you don't mind, I'll stop by tomorrow and get most of my things. I need to download my files from the computer too. No, no, of course not. This is still your house, Jake. She looked up at me finally, and the sadness in her eyes was almost enough to make me reconsidered. She looked so defeated. I took a step toward her leaned in and kissed her cheek. Goodbye, Judy. I turned and walked out the door, 
closing it quietly behind me. I had won, but I had lost. I would have my freedom on my terms, but I had lost what I had hoped for. It seemed such a shabby business, but I would never kid myself that I could live with her after what she had done. I drove to the local motel and went directly to my room. I had checked in earlier that afternoon. I phoned Marta the next morning and told her about my confrontation with Judy. She was pleased that it had gone so easily. No bloodshed. No recriminations. Not even any tears. Some remorse, some apology, but all in all, a quiet ending to my marriage. I thanked her for her advice and hung up. I would drop the papers off on my way to my former home. I let myself in and instantly I was aware that it was no longer my home. I set about removing the rest of my clothes and personal items. I really didn't want anything else. Judy could have the pictures of us. The furniture and furnishings would probably be split down the middle. So it was just a matter of settling what went to whom when the time came. I sat in my office quietly contemplating what was happening. I was putting an end to something I had started nearly eight years ago. I didn't feel particularly good about it. I had to get on with the rest of my life and when I thought about it, I remembered Cindy and I instantly felt better. I began the tedious task of downloading my files into my new laptop. It would take most of the rest of the morning. I had advised Mr. Louie that due to personal problems, I would be unable to provide him with any translations until next week. I apologized, but he was very understanding. It was the first time I had not been able to complete my week's work on time. I promised him I would catch up next week, and he was completely satisfied with that. I would have quite a bit of time to work on my backlog for my motel room. The motel had high-speed wireless, so I was at no disadvantage working there. It wasn't as quiet as the townhouse, but I could manage. I did miss my morning coffee sessions with Cindy, but we were both being careful until she served out with the divorce papers. That would be sometime early next week. I didn't envy Cindy that task. We did meet at an espresso shack on Friday morning, and then parked in an unused lot so that we could talk. How are you holding up? I asked. Okay. I'm not looking forward to telling Al. I've decided I'm going to do it in the morning after the kids have gone to school. It's about the only time we're alone in the house. Marta gave me some advice about how to handle the situation. She said I can insist he leave if there is no reasonable place for him to sleep other than the marital bed. One thing for sure, I'm not having him in my bed one second longer than I have to. What about the kids? When and how are you going to tell them? Assuming Al will be gone or at work when they get home from school, I'll tell them then. You think they can handle it? Annie will be okay. I found out something else about Al that puts the final nail in his coffin. She stopped and sniffed as she sipped her latte. Annie was being teased by one of her classmates the other day. The two girls got into an argument, and when the other girl looked like she was losing to Annie, she said something about Annie's father being a regular visitor to one of her friend's mother's house. Annie started screaming at the girl but she held her ground and said if she didn't believe it, asked the mother. Apparently her name is Mimi Tremont, and she's a divorcee. Cindy looked sad and almost defeated. I didn't ever remember seeing her look like this. How's Annie? I asked. Upset. I calmed her down and told her not to believe everything she hears, but I think she knows, maybe has known for a while. She might be only 10, but kids grow up so fast these days. I'm sorry, Cindy. It shouldn't happen to them like that. It isn't going to be easy telling them that I'm leaving their father. They'll still get to see him, but he's not going to be living with us. I nodded. Despite AL's behavior, taking the kids away from him was going to hurt him and them. I knew Cindy didn't want to deny all visitation. They asked about you, you know, Cindy said after a silence. Oh, I'm surprised. I don't know why you should be. They like you a lot. I think all of us being together will make it easier on them. You're more like a dad than anyone I can think of. Thanks. I'm looking forward to that part. That and having you nearby each day. I said. She reached out and took my hand. You said you wanted to see me. What about... I wanted you to come with me to look at this house I'm thinking of buying. I'd like your opinion, especially since you'll be living there. Sure, let's do that. It will take my mind off the other shit, she said with a weak smile. I had arranged to meet the real estate agent at the house at 11 that morning. We were both right on time. I took Cindy through the house and showed her all the rooms and the areas that I thought needed improvement. It wasn't a luxury home, but it was a nice size with private bedrooms for everyone and two and a half bathrooms. I was also pleased it had a two-car attached garage and a three-quarter basement. Room for storage, a playroom, or if necessary, my office. I like it, Cindy said with a smile. It needs a bit of work, but nothing we can't handle ourselves. Lots of room for the kids and a potential playroom for them in the basement. If you're looking for my okay, you've got it, she said, staying well out of earshot of the agent. Okay, 
Let's go talk Turkey. We'll put in an offer and then see what happens. It's been on the market for four months and you know how slow things are right now. We may just buy ourselves a bargain. We approached the agent and suggested we were willing to make an offer. He nearly jumped when I said that. I suspect he hadn't had too much activity in the past few months due to the economy. Finding a live buyer willing to make an offer was something to celebrate. I deliberately made a lowball offer, knowing that there would be a counter. I was hoping the counter would be a tell as to how desperate they were to sell. There was no furniture in the house, and I wondered if the previous owners were carrying two mortgages. We left before noon and Cindy offered to buy lunch today. I agreed and we stopped at a sushi bar, Cindy being positive she would never find Al in a place where they served bait for food. I had to laugh. She was getting her old sense of humor back, but I thought it would probably be temporary until she dealt with Al next week. I wished I could be with her to give her support, but that was out of the question. The weekend was terribly lonely at the motel. Judy was gone from my life, and even though we weren't close near the end, at least it was someone to talk to. Someone to have around. That was gone now, and I couldn't see Cindy either, so I was on my own. Saturday I went for a walk along the river, just to give myself a break. I had decided to use the time to catch up on my work, and I thought by Sunday afternoon I would be current again. I knew Mr. Louie would be happy with that. I got through Saturday and Sunday, and as I expected, by Monday morning I was current with my work. I called Mr. Louie after I emailed my last manual to him, and he was surprised and happy that I was once again up to date. He wanted to see me soon if I could find the time. He had a special project that he wondered if I would be interested in. Naturally, I couldn't say no to the man. So we agreed to meet on Tuesday morning. I called Cindy and she had received word from Marta that all the paperwork was in order, and it was now up to Cindy as to how she would notify Al of her intent to divorce him. She was about to call me when I called her, and she wanted to meet to discuss her strategy. I think she was very nervous about this, and I thought perhaps it might be wiser to have someone serve Al with the papers. Cindy was having none of that. No, absolutely not. He'd go ballistic and anything could happen. No, no, this is something I have to do myself. Maybe I can make him understand just how much he's hurt me and the children. I'm not going to change my mind and I'm not going to forgive him. He brought this on himself and I'm going to put an end to it. I let him get away with it before and all that did was give him a chance to step on me again. Fool me once, that's the limit. I wish I could be there to help, but... I was sure Cindy knew the offer was sincere, but impossible. I'm going to do it tomorrow morning. I don't suppose I'll sleep at all, thinking about what I have to do, but I don't know any other way. I can't have the children around to witness it. I won't let someone else do it for me. That would be cowardly. No, I just have to suck it up and get it done, she said. Good luck, was all I could think of to say. Tuesday morning I got up, went through my usual morning ritual, gathered up my laptop and headed for the restaurant attached to the motel. I decided to cheat and have a full breakfast. Eggs, bacon, hash browns, and toast. It was the $3.99 special and I laughed that I was still in conservation mode despite my newfound prosperity. I had a second cup of coffee, waiting to make sure rush hour was now over before heading off to Mr. Louie's office. I wondered how Cindy was making out with Al. I didn't envy her, but it was something she insisted she had to do herself. She was an extraordinarily strong woman, and the thought that perhaps we could become closer was exciting. I met with Mr. Louie just after 9 that morning, and he surprised me with something I hadn't expected. He was looking at bringing in a line of light and medium duty tractors, backhoes, front end loaders, and forklifts from China. The operating and maintenance manuals for any one of these machines would be far larger and more complex than anything I had done before. At first I was reluctant. I don't know, Mr. Louie. This is a very big project. I'm not sure I could handle this alone. I'm not sure I know enough about the equipment to properly prepare the manuals. I don't know what to say, I said apologetically. Mr. Jake, you are very good at your work. Can you find people to help you? I will pay $100 each hour. There will be many hours to do this work, I know. Only you I trust to do it right. Many, many dollars for you if you can do this. I must hope you can help me, he said. There was no doubt he was pleading with me. I just had to figure out a way it could be done, and I would be looking at a very big payday. Mr. Louie, I can't promise anything, but let me think about how it might be done. Please let me see one of the manuals they have prepared, and then I can tell you if I can help. Thank you, Mr. Jake. I trust you. You are very good for me in my business. Thank you. I left and headed home with one of the forklift manuals in hand. At least I knew something about how forklifts operated. I had used one many times in my customer service days years ago. As I drove along, I suddenly thought of Cindy. I felt a cold shiver pass through me. 
I pulled out my cell phone and began to look for her number. I stopped before I pressed the preset. What if I was still there? What if things had gone really wrong? If I phoned and Elle answered, I could hang up, but what would he think? No, I would have to sweat it out and wait until I got to her place before I decided. If Al was still there, his car would be out front. That would be the tip-off. I pushed my Camry more quickly than I would normally. I kept looking at my watch. If I kept up this speed I should be at her townhouse by 10.30. As I turned into the cul-de-sac I saw no sign of AL's Malibu. I didn't assume anything. I stopped a few doors away and punched in Cindy's number. It rang twice before it was picked up. Hello. It was a soft and quiet Cindy answering the phone. Cindy, it's Jake. Are you alright? Yeah. I'm okay. Can you come over? I could use the company. I'm almost outside your door. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't still there. No, no. Ale's gone. Come on in. The coffee's ready. It was a dispirited Cindy by the sound of her voice. I was relieved she was okay, but anxious to hear what had happened. I parked the car and went around to the back and walked in, just as I would have in the past. Cindy was sitting at the kitchen table, her head in her hands. She looked like hell, her eyes reddened and her face forlorn. Hi, was all I said as I poured myself a coffee and sat down beside her. What happened? She turned and looked at me and then began shaking her head. He completely came apart, Jake. He broke down, crying and wailing about what was he going to do without me. He was begging me on his knees to give him one more chance. It was so pathetic that he had me crying too. Did he agree to leave? I asked. Yeah, not that I gave him much choice. He tried to bullshit me about how I had it all wrong and someone was out to get him, and that I didn't have much faith in him to believe these lies. What a hopeless a-hole he is. When I told him I knew about Judy and suggested maybe that's why you're divorcing her, I thought he was going to puke. He turned every single color but pink. Then I hit him with Mimi Tremont and what the girl at school had taunted Annie with, and I was sure he was going to pass out. That's when he lost it. That sounds horrible. How are you now? I don't feel great, Jake. Like you, that's 10 years down the drain. 10 years I can't get back. Part of me is mad and part of me is sad. There's a big difference between your 10 years and my 7, I said. Oh yeah, like what? Like Annabeth and Bradley? She looked at me, and I could see the tears begin to form. I took her hands in mine and squeezed them gently. Hold on, Cindy. Hold on. Now it was Cindy's turn to come undone. All I could do was hold her and let her get it all out. Purge the system. Get ready to get up and answer the bell again. She was a strong woman and she would be okay when this was all done. That didn't mean she would forget or that it wouldn't hurt. It meant that she could get past it and go on with her life. Whatever that turned out to be. Talk to me, Cindy. Tell me what happened. She had regained enough composure to speak, and she was leaning into me as I held her. I thought to myself that if we never became more than just good friends, it would be a mistake not to try for more. She was a special person, and one I admired and I think I now loved. The question for both of us, was what kind of love? She began to talk. She told of having Elle sit in the kitchen, while she told him she was filing for divorce. He was shocked at first, but then in typical Elle fashion, he began to bluster, trying to bullshit his way out of whatever box Cindy was putting him in. Unfortunately, it wasn't a fair fight. Cindy was too smart and too well prepared to let him get away with that. When he realized he wasn't going to be able to talk his way out of this, he played the sympathy card, ringing in the children and all their years together and the parents and all the good memories. Cindy said he made it easier for her. He was so phony with his contrite attitude that she didn't feel any compunction about nailing him with his sins, included the ones he thought she had forgiven him for. By the end of the drama, Al was a puddle of sobbing mush. She had preempted him by packing a bag with his things and pulling it out into the kitchen, telling him to hit the road and don't come back until she gave him permission. Al of course misunderstood, thinking that he was being sentenced to a short-term exclusion. When Cindy slapped the divorce papers in his hand, he began to figure out that he was gone for good. The only thing he would be coming back for was the rest of his clothes and possessions, and Cindy would be watching to make sure he didn't take anything he wasn't entitled to. He was a beaten man when he walked out the door, dragging his suitcase behind him. I wish I had been here for you, Cindy, I said. No, that wouldn't work, Jake. I had to do this myself. It wasn't fun and it wasn't easy, but I had to do it myself. Don't start blaming yourself because I'm upset. I know you mean well, but it had to be done and it had to be done hard and fast. Well, I guess you and I are about to start the rest of our lives, I said. I'm just happy that I'm still going to have you as part of that at least for a while. Her head popped up, and she gave me the damnedest look. Are you having second thoughts about us? 
That was a no-nonsense question. Of course not. It's just, it's your choice, Cindy. Whatever becomes of us, it will always be your choice. Jake faults. What a cop-out. First you tell me you have feelings for me, then you lay it all on my shoulders. What kind of man are you? She demanded. I looked at her, and I couldn't help it. I know I had a wrinkled smile on my lips. She couldn't help it either. I could see it in her eyes. She wrapped her arms around my neck and pulled me in for one big, long, sensuous kiss. I don't think we're going to be separated anytime soon. As I expected, the offer on the house was countered, but not too far from my ideal price. I had our agent recounter, and the deal was done when they accepted. I now owned a four-bedroom house in a very nice neighborhood. I'm almost embarrassed at how easily I got over being divorced from Judy. I've come to the conclusion that I never did love her. Not really. Not the way my parents love each other. Not the way I had envisioned a loving wife. All I have to compare it to is what I now see and what I now know. The depth of emotion just wasn't there on either part. I haven't seen Judy since the divorce papers were signed. The final decree will be issued in February. The word is that she and Bobby Boy took off with damn little aside from his Mercedes. His soon-to-be ex-wife is now running the lab and its business as usual. I guess Judy lost out on her dream twice in a row. Al is still working at the Chev dealer, although we hear he is a much different personality these days. His divorce from Cindy will be final in March. He visits his children every week, but otherwise keeps his head down. We don't think the single life agrees with him quite as much as he might have hoped. Cindy cut him some slack at my suggestion. She's not asking for alimony or child support. Al is down and despite his behavior, neither Cindy nor I would get any satisfaction from kicking him. Our income will be all we ever need financially, and as for Al, he'll need every dime he can earn for the next while. He still has the few remaining mortgage payments and his overloaded credit cards. Playing around can be quite expensive. Cindy and I are quite a different story. She doesn't take shit from anyone, including me. I will never to my dying day understand why Al Willows would want to fool around on her. Just give that man the dumb shit award in perpetuity. I love that woman like crazy, and I'll fight to the death to keep her. Cindy doesn't do things in half measures. When she says she's in love with me, I'm definitely not going to argue with her. Besides, what's the point? I'm getting all the benefits of her high opinion of me. I'm glad I'm reasonably fit. God forbid I should disappoint her. We didn't need the fourth bedroom as a bedroom for very long. Cindy sat down with the kids after she gave Al the boot and explained what was going to happen. Annie, who knew about her father's stupidity, was less upset than Brad. But both of them had to be reassured that they would still be seeing their father. Brad was pretty quiet for a few days, but gradually, as most kids do, he adapted. When Cindy told the kids that they would be moving into a new house with a big backyard and a play area in the basement and still going to the same school, the heat was off. When she told them I would be living with them in the house, Brad actually cheered and Annie nodded her okay. It seemed that they had the same feelings toward me that I had toward them. Cindy said kids pick up on adult vibes, and they knew how I felt about them. We moved into the new house just after Halloween. I took Annie and Brad out for trick-or-treat in their old neighborhood, and it was fun to watch them as they went from door to door. They always said, thank you, and despite the costumes, they were often saying hi to kids they recognized from school. There was no sign of Al that night. I think he decided it wasn't something he could handle. I used some of my cash and hired proper movers to get us relocated into our new home. Judy and I had decided on what furniture we would split and I chose not to argue about small things. Al was now living with a friend from work and had no room for furniture. We were doing him a favor by taking their stuff to the new house, making sure he received half the current estimated value. At the end of it all, I only had to buy a TV for the kids and a couple of things for the dining room and kitchen. Christmas isn't that far away and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure I'll spoil Cindy, Annie and Brad terribly, but if I'm careful, I won't get too much heat from Cindy. She knows how I feel about them and I think that's what's making our new life so much easier. That and the sex, of course. Remember, I'm coming off a once a week or so tepid encounter. Cindy is more, what's the word, robust, when it comes to sex. Uninhibited is another word I could use. Let's just say I'm doing fine, thank you. Cindy has a lot to say when we have sex, so in order to keep from disturbing the children, I set up my office in the bedroom between ours and theirs. We also have discovered the benefits of working from home during the day. The happy hour has been moved to midday, and I can tell you it really is a happy hour. Oh yes, my new career. I have found a man who is multilingual and an engineer. He's ideal for this project of Mr. Louis, and he and I met with my boss to discuss how we could do this project. The upshot is that I now have a contract to produce maintenance manuals in English, French, and Spanish. 
It would appear that Mr. Louie has eyes on the American market. I have several years of work ahead of me by the look of it. Not all Mr. Louis, of course. Other people have found out about my capabilities, and I am going to have to expand to handle the demand. Not just for imports now, but exports as well. Cindy is my personal assistant, and I couldn't have chosen a more capable person. She is dynamite at handling negotiations, scheduling, and financial management. My partner is my partner. And finally, to the delight of the children, Cindy and I are getting married. We'll be doing it during spring break for the kids, and we'll be doing it in Hawaii. I'm bringing my parents and my brother out for the occasion. Cindy's mother is a widow, and she'll be there too. I gather she never did have a high opinion of Al, so I guess I'm starting with a clean slate with her. This time it's going to last. This time it is for keeps. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.